There we go. And we are there. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, Dr. Armstrong. Yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, so you do, it's, it's maggot debridement therapy? Well, yeah, I suppose from time to time, uh, 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 as needed, uh, we'll use uh, we'll use larvae uh, to uh, to clean up wounds. Uh, and you know, <laughs> I guess they're you know they're like nature's uh, uh, little surgeons. Um, and uh, remarkably, if you use uh, you know the, the the species that has actually essentially been raised for it, which is I think called Lucilia sericata, and it's made by uh, uh, Dr. Ron Sherman uh, here in uh, Irvine, California, at I think Monarch Labs, used to be at University of California, Irvine. Um, then that species, um, remarkably, it, it, it removes just um, what's dead on wounds and leaves behind kind of a nice uh, sustainable wound environment that we might later help to skin graft or might help it heal a little bit better, might reduce the risk for infection. Yeah, it's really impressive. I was watching a video before this of the procedure and, um, you know, it's, it's a little, it's a little freaky, but I mean, after the kind of stuff I've been researching, I think, I think it's, it's worth it. Oh, Eli. Well, look, I think, well, you, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, kind of, it is a little creeptastic, but it is, it's terrific in that, um, it is, you know, um, we could be at one time, well, as an example of just, uh, a couple of days ago, um, we were using, um, uh, a type of a, a spread on skin that we actually have uh, grown in the laboratory. Um, and we were using that uh, on a patient that just the week before um, we had used uh, maggots larvae uh, to help clean up uh, uh, her wound. Um, and uh, the two, you know, super old school, low tech and very high tech, you know, don't have to be mutually exclusive. In fact, they can work together. And I think you have to, I don't think you have to uh, do away with the old just because the uh, new are around. And I think, you know, when you try to mash some of these ideas up, uh, whether it's in medicine and surgery or whether it's in uh, the arts or the sciences, I think sometimes bringing these sorts of things together is what it's all about. Completely. Yeah. It really shows you the art behind medicine. You know, it's every doctor is going to do something a little different and, you're going to have That's, these intersections of old and new too. Isn't that the case without a doubt. So, um, you teach, you teach surgery at a medical institution. Yeah. So I'm a professor of surgery here at, uh, the Keck school of medicine of uh, university of Southern California in Los Angeles. And, uh, and I helped to run a group, uh, called the Southwestern academic limb salvage alliance or salsa. And I think we're the the most active group uh, in the world dedicated to uh, reducing uh, amputations and the risk for amputation in people with diabetes. Wow, <laughs> that's really impressive. Um, what kind of other procedures, you know, with biomedicine do you do? Well, I suppose uh, my, my area uh, in sort of, uh, as it were, biosurgery is limited to, uh, to larvae. There aren't a whole lot of other sort of um, uh, techniques or technologies, although some of my really good friends might from time to time use um, leeches yeah. um, on, uh, although there's other things you can use now as well, but leeches sometimes work very well on if you've say um, had to take tissue from one part of the body and put it into another, it's a, 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 a free tissue transfer. Sometimes you have to sew the little baby arteries and uh, veins uh, together, but those veins take a little while to kind of uh, consolidate and mature. And so to limit the risk for um, too much swelling and the actual swelling killing that, that tissue and to keep it alive, sometimes you have to get rid of some of that back pressure. And mm -hmm. the little guys and gals uh, uh, that you put on there, the little, uh, those little leeches can actually uh, uh, be quite useful there. And there's other things you can do as well, but Leeches are still used. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I in my paper, I write a little bit about le medical leech therapy, the uh, the maggot debridement therapy, and also some of the you know um, 
other helminth therapies with hookworm or things like that. Oh that yeah, are, there you go. Little... That's a that seems uh, almost uh, um, uh, you know uh, uh, unbelievable. Some of the data associated with uh, uh, you know folks that are using uh, you know helminth kind of therapy for various sorts of things where they have might have a, a kind of a persistent uh, uh, inflammatory state or mm -hmm. uh, some of the autoimmune uh, uh, disease. But there are data. Uh, to suggest that that may be helpful in some cases too. And I, I look forward to more work in that area too. Exactly. Me too. It's kind of one of those things where it's, it needs a lot more uh, development, but I'm just hoping so much that, that it turns out to be like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, again, uh, you and me both, I think there's no reason to uh, discard some of these uh, uh, older ideas, especially uh, when we can provide, you know, data to support it. Uh, but if there's something better, then we should use that too. Sure, completely. Uh, yeah, it's going to be hard to convince enough people to sign up for tests for that too. Well, but you'd be amazed actually with the with the maggots. Um, it's uh, it's a bit hard to explain, but I must say that that what's been persistently and forever uh, surprising to me, and you know, we've treated quite a number of patients with uh, with. Uh, maggot debridement therapy as it were um but it's uh, strangely it draws a lot of our patients in to the mm. therapy not the it doesn't repulse uh them like you might think right uh, um sure and it's it's interesting because very often people have uh that develop these wounds especially in diabetes they've the reason they've developed the wound is because they've um lost what one of my mentors uh, paul brand he used to call the gift of pain right and mm. and so they they develop what's called neuropathy and they could literally wear a hole in their foot. Like you'd wear a hole or I'd wear a hole in a sock. Um, that hole is called an ulcer or a wound, diabetic mm -hmm. foot ulcer, diabetic foot wound. It happens every second around the world now. But um, when you lose that, you might, you might uh, feel, think like you're, you know, feeling the same as you did the day before, but you're, you're, you're not, and you're going to behave differently uh, when you don't have that painful feedback. And sometimes people can almost dissociate themselves from, from that part of their body because they're not even thinking about it. Mm. And this, for whatever reason, sometimes draws them in I, I, in a really strange way. Yeah, that is strange. I have a couple of questions about the procedure itself. Sure. So, well, first of all, the little container that you have all the maggots in, I couldn't imagine being able to like, get just the right amount out of there for like so fast Did yeah it's never tricky to like scoop them up uh, well there's that's a good question there look the the um there is some um there, there's some guidance on how many uh, uh, uh larvae you might use per square say centimeter um mm -hmm. in a wound uh but in fact most of the so the container itself it looks just like a little specimen container and it actually comes now with a little um it almost like a little tea bag as it were um and you can just kind of open that area up and just take it out now with some forceps and just place it right into the wound now and they all all little guys and gals they know exactly where to go they're not gonna um it's it's not like you're gonna find them uh, uh escaping and turning into flies or something yeah. crazy like that it actually um, they are uh, thankfully programmed to go to uh, you know where they need to go in terms of if there's some, maybe some some tissue that's uh, necrotic that, that, that needs to be uh, debrided. So if you put them in the general area, uh, you guess, I guess you're something of a, instead of a surgeon, you might be kind of like a maggot wrangler. Uh, sure. But, <laughs> but uh, that just happened. Uh, but uh, but but you could um, I think if you just set them in that area. Uh, most of the time they're going to stay in that area. We also put a little, there are also dressings um, now that have been created uh, by uh, these laboratories by, by Ron Sherman and, and his team uh, that are also really kind of elegant for just uh, uh, keeping them into place. Yeah, it's, it's really impressive that the maggots know to just eat the necrotic, you know, tissue and things like that. And that, that if, if more people kind of understood that, that would definitely take away a lot. Yeah. Of yeah. I think, look, this is all about communication. And uh, I think just talking to the patient about what to expect, uh, if, if this is going to be used and when is it going to be used? And it's, a, 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 um, I think is a, uh, um, is probably, is probably helpful. I think just, I think you'd probably have a very different reaction if you just walked in the room 
uh, with some maggots with you and threw them uh, on the patient, that'd probably be a very different sort of discussion. Of uh, you'd be having with it. But that wouldn't be very good doctoring now, would it? Yeah. And, no. and, and were I a larva, a, a little uh, a, a little larva, I, I wouldn't want to be introduced uh, to my uh, a, a host uh, environment like that either. Mm -hmm. Now, another question I had was, um, when the procedure starts, everything everything seems pretty, um, I guess the right word is dry, you know, and the the gauze and everything is wrapped on loosely and things like that. Yeah. And it's all pretty clean. And then maybe 72 hours later, it's all like swollen up and everything. What's happening there? Oh, well, it's not really swollen up and all. I, I think it depends. So, so usually when you put it on a wound, there's more dead tissue there, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, but, but if you, uh, uh, then when you put the, the larvae on, you ought to look for this. When you look at your before and after, I'm sure you can go online mm. uh, and see some, some uh, videos, but uh, what you'll find is you'll find the, the little larvae are really small. I mean, just fractions of the size of a grain of rice. Mm. Um, and then um, what you'll find is when you, when you, when the dressing is taken off, uh, maybe at three days or so. Um, what you'll find is is very often the the larvae, in order for them to digest the dead tissue, um, they it's it's really they they digest outside their body, mm -hmm. so, so it's they're literally kind of spitting it out and then bringing everything back in. Um, but then if you look at the larvae at 72 hours, usually the wound's a lot more clean, especially if you just sort of flush the area with some some saline, sure, or saline if you're in England, and and then uh, and then. Um, when you look at the, the little critters, as it were, um, inside of them, usually right in the center, you'll see some, often some darker tissue uh, in there because mm -hmm. literally you are what you eat. And these guys, it is, that is what they have consumed. And the, the larvae tend to now be so much more chubby. They're like 20 times their previous volume. They're like now literally the size of a grain of rice. Yeah, so they've gone from huge. just like, uh, just in, you know, very, very small to a lot larger. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's remarkable. I mean, you can almost quantify how well they've done by, uh, by that size. Mm -hmm. So then once, once the maggots are all out, <laughs> yeah. which is kind of the scariest part, yeah. um, what's, what's usually the next step for most patients? Like now yeah. that everything's cleaned up, what do you, yeah. what do you usually do after? Well, the goal, what we use, we tend to use um, maggot therapy on patients where we might want to limit the number of times we take them to the operating room. Mm -hmm. uh, they may they may be really sick with, uh, you know, uh, and have a whole bunch of other kind of what we call comorbid conditions, other other sorts of problems that might put them at risk um, for, for bringing them into the uh, operating room routinely, or um, there uh, may be not a lot of benefit for bringing someone into the operating room for various reasons. And we may just want to try to keep the wound clean and uninfected. That's a small segment of our, uh, of the population that we might treat this on, but the next treatment after, after this might be either a, if the wound is clean, thank goodness. Um, and you can just go with sort of a regular kind of, uh, uh, dressing that may just maybe maintain moisture in the wound and allow the body to kind of move through a natural or a more natural process um, in healing. B, you might reapply the the larvae so they can have another go over another few days. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, two or three applications are for this. Um, in fact, during the pandemic, we've actually done this and we've, we've done this at home now uh, for mm -hmm. some of our patients rather than um, in the, uh, in the hospital where we have almost always done it. Um, the, or C, if the wound is looking cleaner, um, then you may want to do something else to try to get it closed. If it's just about ready for that, you might do what's called a skin graft where you just take a little bit of skin. It's like almost like skinning your knee on a bike or, or mm -hmm. something or a skateboard. Um, that's about that thin. You can take that off of, uh, of someone's, uh, uh leg or thigh and then apply it. Mm -hmm. um, onto the wound as well. And, uh, put that into place that, uh, that may be a possibility, or you can take tissue from one area and transplant it. Like we talked about earlier. Mm. So where along in your, you know, medical education, did you hear about, uh, the whole maggot therapy and just what really pushed you to introduce this into the range of things you did? Yeah, I was, um, you know, I'm trying to remember the first time I've used, I used them. Um, and I think it may have been, 
um, when I was in uh, San Antonio, when I was in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, uh, we had a, a great uh, um, uh, uh, limb preservation team there um, at University of Texas Health Science Center. And I think um, I was treating a couple of patients where I had kind of limited options and what I, what I could use uh, on them. And I couldn't bring them into the operating for whatever reason or because, uh, because of some of the reasons I had mentioned before and some of the other sort of tricks that we had up our sleeve in terms of kind of wound products or things that might help to clean up a wound were limited. Uh, so I, and I had um, read a, a bit uh, about uh, uh, the potential for larval therapy. And I called up at that time, uh, uh, Ron Sherman, who had just started working in this area. And I've mentioned him a bunch of times. It's like, a, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like, like a Dr. Sherman fanboy here, but he and I, um, I think connected even way back then. And uh, I remember him sending some to me there in San Antonio. Uh, then we did a bit more when I was doing work in England. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a facility in South Wales um, that uh, does a very, very similar kind of um, laboratory where you can order them. And I used quite a lot of this uh, when I was in, in the UK and Manchester. Um, and then when I went back to the United States after that, I, um, in, in Arizona, um, um, I used it even more, both at the Veterans Affairs uh, Hospital there and also at the University uh, of Arizona. Ah, I see. So, okay. So then this was after you, or after you were in medical school? Correct. I was not, I, I never, I never encountered it when I was training. Um, I just read about it. Um, I had certainly seen leeches being used on, mm -hmm. uh, on flaps because that was a bit more common. Um, but the, the, uh, the larvae, you know, just the availability of it were not, was not, uh, present, uh, at the time. And was, uh, but I, yeah, this was, a, this was not, uh, this was not until after I had finished, um, my, you know, my training. Um, but back in the time, back the time that I was doing it, uh, you know, a lot of people were really largely ignoring, unfortunately. A lot of these um, people with diabetes and with um, uh, wounds and, uh, you know, may, many people said, you know, yeah, um, why are you even bothering? Why don't you just cut this person's leg off and be done with it? Mm. Um, and, you know, for some patients, that might be the best thing, but for sure, not for uh, uh, most, not for almost mm. all of our patients. Certainly, if it was your mom, dad, or granddad, or, gran or grandma, I, would, I don't think you'd want that. And and, uh, and as a, as a doc, you know, you're th th those kind of things when I, when you, when you see that really hurts, you know, and you want to be able to do something and this is provided kind of a nice little, uh, you know, a nice uh, little addition to our, to our tool chest, because that's really what it is, isn't it? You know, what, whatever you're doing and you're gaining experience as a, as you know, in life, it's uh, you know, some total of your experiences. And this is yet another kind of thing you could pull out of your back pocket. It's just a little more kind of uh, curious and creepy. Completely. I mean, it's it's just a way of kind of kickstarting or clearing the way for the body to really do the rest of the work for you. Uh, yeah, there, there you are. There you are. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing where uh, it, it has been uh, it, it has been used now uh, sort of in this manner uh, from time to time, maybe over the last 25 or 30 years before uh, or and then before that, just intermittently, maybe for the last hundred um, before that, it. Um, it was not, uh, uh, there was there maybe some documented uses uh, in the battlefield, like for instance, some observations uh, in the Civil War in the U.S. Uh, where some surgeons found that people that had, uh, believe it or not, I mean, this sounds really gross, but, but people that actually had um, flies and maggots left uh, on them mm. survived after these amputations, whereas um, others did not it was just pure observation and pure anecdote and that that uh, but uh, that led to maybe a co couple of generations later uh, in the early 1900s and 19 teens people looking at it as a potential treatment for people with uh, certain kinds of infections especially even even believe it or not bone infections mm -hmm. um, and uh, then beyond that uh, it, it uh, sort of went from there uh, uh, with you know fits and starts uh, up through the, uh, the 1900s mm, I I should, yeah, into the 2000s. Well, yeah. Cause when, when you see the transition of maybe like 
like you said, you know, just an observation about leeches. I mean, not leeches, maggots. Uh, and also similarly with leeches, you know, it's almost parallel to the whole like bloodletting thing. Like just oh, yeah. removing well, look, your blood. You know, you're right. I, it's uh, it, it um, you know, it, so much of this uh, seems so medieval, quite literally. Uh, and uh, you look at, uh, you know, the whole humoral theory of medicine. Mm. We're only, you know, let's understand this, I, you know, and and being you know having this discussion peri pandemic uh, or kind of almost peri apocalyptic mm -hmm. perspective as it were we are only a few generations uh from sort of the last of the the if you will barber uh surgeons where mm -hmm. um you know a lot of surgery was done uh, uh, uh including bloodletting by the way in the barber shop mm -hmm. um uh and uh, whereas a, a lot of and and physicians and surgeons were different. You know, you had barber surgeons and then you had physicians, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know even the language was different. And that a lot of that has merged, but um, a lot of these crazy ideas um, have remained just that crazy and not very helpful. Um, but um, and just anecdotal, but they were passed down and um, but. Now, I think as more and more data emerge and we're able to compare one, one technology to another, um, I think um, you know, we can slowly kind of, with fits and starts, kind of move forward to get to, uh, you know, to, to improve care for our patients. And it's, it's true even for something as, as bizarre and ridiculous and barbaric sounding as something as this, and it's forever fascinating to me, but I, I just don't think we need to throw out the therapeutic baby with the bathwater, as it mm. were. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's these these glimpses into what could be in the future, even if we may have had the wrong idea about something, you know, as long as people were getting better, there must have been something going on behind the scenes. Right. And I think the key is to try to get to that in as elegant and as um, safe and as efficient a way as possible, systematically. And that hasn't been the case um, in some cases in medicine and surgery where so much is dogma. And that's mm. true still, by the way, in, in, you know, it, it, as you, some stuff is passed down, but it's less true now. It's, it's so much better now um, than it was just even a generation ago and certainly even more than a hundred years ago. And that takes nothing away from the great, the great uh, um, uh, women and men that preceded us um, mm -hmm. because you have to build on all that stuff. You know, it's, this is how uh, things move forward in, in any, in any specialty, in any profession, right? Uh, he begat her who begat him and, you know, you're going back, but the key, and, but the key thing is, is not to uh, take everything that your mentor says as gospel uh, mm -hmm. when you're getting trained, it's to take that, but then build on it. Right. And pay it forward. Incredible. Yes. Well, thank you very much. That's all the questions I have. I really enjoyed this interview. Oh, no, the, the pleasure, uh, Eli, is all mine. And I, I wish you just to can keep doing what you're doing, man. Go out there and keep asking questions and, and make a difference. And, and you pay it forward. It's such an exciting time for you, man. Thank you. Yes. I'll make sure I'll make sure to send you an invitation to my presentation if you'd like to see it. I totally look forward to it, man. Great. OK, thank you so and much. And I'll send you the. Uh, a copy of this recording. Ah, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. When I get it, I'm sure it'll, I think it's, e does it get emailed to me? I think it does. Sure. We'll, we'll, it, it, it'll take a while. So whenever you're free. That sounds great, man. Take Thanks. care and be well. Have a great day. Bye. All right. For sure. I will do. Oh, I'm going to stop recording.